Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the first of our five midweek Lenten devotions for this year. Today is Wednesday, February 24th, 2021. We begin with a prayer. Jesus, I will ponder now on your holy passion. With your spirit, me endow for such meditation. Grant that I, in love and faith, may the image cherish of your suffering, pain, and death, that I may not perish. Amen. Our psalm for today is Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do vile deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the human race to see if there is one who is wise, one who seeks God. All have turned away. All alike have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Will evildoers never understand? They consume my people as they consume bread. They do not call on the Lord. Then they will be filled with dread, for God is with those who are righteous. You sinners frustrate the plans of the oppressed, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. And we pray. Oh, Lord, spare us from the folly of wickedness and the pursuit of evil. Make us rejoice in your saving acts, that we who have been redeemed by your Son may abound in works of faith, hope, and love. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. This year, we will be reading the history of our Lord's Passion as it is recorded for us by the Gospel writer, Mark. I'm going to read the first portion of Mark's account of our Savior's Passion, which will take us up through the first celebration of the Lord's Supper. It was two days before the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a cunning way to arrest Jesus and kill him. Not during the festival, they said, so that there won't be a riot among the people. While he was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured it on his head. But some were expressing indignation to one another. Why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. They began to scold her. Jesus replied, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a noble thing for me. You always have the poor with you, and you can do what is good for them whenever you want. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body in advance for burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. And when they heard this, they were glad and promised to give him money. So we started looking for a good opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and prepare the Passover so that you may eat it? So he sent two of his disciples and told them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house. The teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. So the disciples went out, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening came, he arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one by one, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve the one who is dipping bread in the bowl with me. For the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. As they were eating, he took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them. 
and they all drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. In our midweek Lenten devotions this year, we're going to consider various sections from sermons preached by Martin Luther based on the accounts of Jesus' passion that we're going to read each week. This week, we're going to be looking at comments that Martin Luther made concerning the celebration of the Lord's Supper. We especially want to consider how we are worthy to receive the Lord's Supper. The Lord does tell us that a man should examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup, and he warns us against receiving the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. So how do we become worthy? Well, in and of ourselves, we are not worthy. Luther freely confesses that. Yet Christ makes us worthy. If we wait until we in ourselves are worried before we come to the Lord's Supper, we will never come. No, the Lord's Supper is given for us, for sinners, that we might receive the forgiveness of sins, which Jesus gives to us through his body and his blood in the sacrament. But you say, I am not worthy. Well, that is my temptation too. You heard in the papist sermons that we should be entirely pure without a blemish. That is why we are so timorous. And the heart at once says, I am not worthy. So I decide to wait until the next Sunday, until I am better. And the next Sunday goes over to the next and so on, till the quarter of the year and the half and the whole. But if I waited until I were entirely pure and had no more reproaches of conscience, I should in that case never come, or not for a very long time. A distinction is to be made, however, in the case of brazen sinners guilty of adultery, usury, extortion, theft, public hate, or envy. To such rough, wild persons, one should say, stay away. They are not ready for the forgiveness of sins. They wish to remain evil. But if your sins are not such that they should be publicly reproved by the congregation, you should not abstain, but should say to yourself, I do not come in my own righteousness. In that case, I would never come. A child is not baptized because it is godly, and I do not go to confession because I am pure. I go as one who is unworthy, who cannot be worthy. God preserve me from being unworthy. We are always looking at our hands rather than at Christ's mouth. We ought to say, I see what thou sayest, not what I do. Strange that some are afraid of the sacrament. The peasants are troubled because they think they must have left all their sins. No wonder that under the papacy, the people took it so hard. The papists have corrupted the sacrament with gall, vinegar, and wormwood, and taken all the joy out of it. For we were taught that we must be so pure that not one fleck of the least sin should remain upon us, and so holy that for sheer holiness our Lord God could not look upon us. I was not able to find that in myself, and on that account I was terrified, and I am still plagued by this residue from the papacy. But now joy is coming back. Of course, it is true that we should be godly, and if you love your sins more than God's grace, stay away. But the Lord's Supper is a sweet, savory food from which you are not to derive poison and death. Listen, it is given for you, not against you. For your soul's comfort, strength, and redemption was it given. Christ does not put you under the water of baptism in order to drown you, but that you may be saved from your sins, and likewise in the Lord's Supper. That is why you should learn the use and the purpose. Here Christ has established the sacrament for you and for me. I feel that I am a scoundrel, that the devil has taken hold of me, that I do not do what I should. People in this case ought to be invited to take the sacrament. They should not dread it as a frightful judgment. That feeling arises from the old custom or from the devil. But Christians should come with joy and confidence and think, I will eat his flesh and blood. Why has he given them to me? 
Surely he will not cast me off if I seek only in his name to be blessed and look for help and comfort. Let us pray. O living bread from heaven, how well you feed your guest. The gifts that you have given have filled my heart with rest. O wondrous food of blessing, O cup that heals our woes. My heart, this gift possessing, with praises overflows. Lord, grant me then, thus strengthened, with heavenly food while here my course on earth is lengthened, to serve with holy fear. And when you call my spirit to leave this world below, I enter through your merit, where joys unmingled flow. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for spending this time with me as we contemplate our Savior's passion during this Lenten season. May the Lord richly bless your day, and I will look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday.